Welcome to the Find My Catalyst podcast. Sales is another word for problem solving. We all have problems we're looking to solve and we know that there are solutions out there, but we struggle with this. How do we find the solution? Where does that nudge come to help us take the next step so that we can get out there and start solving tough problems? The intention of this podcast is to help you find your catalyst and take that next step. I'm Mike Simmons. I'm the founder of Catalyst Sale. And today I'm really excited to bring Dan John onto the podcast. Dan John is an author, he's a coach, and he's a trainer. And I hope you enjoy the discussion I had with Dan as much as I did. Dan, thank you very much for doing this. I have uh, been paying attention to you for a number of years and then finally felt compelled to send you a note and see if you'd be interested in joining me on, on the podcast. When someone who has a sales podcast says, hey, can you join me on a podcast? What was your first thought? You just asked me to do a podcast that had no... Perfect. I just, I didn't know if it was about five sets of five or two sets of 10. I didn't, I just said, sure, I'll do a podcast. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about basics because I think the, uh, there's a, uh, so when it comes to, so we, we, actually let's give people a little bit of background and we'll include links to, to your, okay. to your content. Sure, good. Yeah. But let's give them a little bit of background. Dan, who are you? Oh, what I hate you? this question. Yeah. Well, I'm the youngest of six and athletic military family. And I think it was really helpful as an athlete to be the youngest of six. And so my whole career, we're a blue collar family. We struggled, parents struggled. And uh, it really, every good lesson I ever learned probably was in the playing street football and basketball and all that. We never we didn't do, or, none of us did organized sports until high school because that's when my dad's role. And then of course we all had great athletic careers because we didn't start until high school. So there was no burnout and there was no, started throwing the discus in the ninth grade because my hero threw the discus and I wanted to play football and I was, I was good in football. I was, but weirdly, even though I was very undersized at the time, <laughs> I was youngest kid in the class and I'm Irish. So I don't hit puberty until 40. Uh, so, but what was nice is by the time my body kicked in, I was the first person to lift weights. I was the first person to turn the discus. I was the first person to buy discus throwing shoes. So I was always, even though my competition was DNA in me, you know, they were hitting puberty and they were 5, 10, 155 pounds of man muscle. By the time I hit puberty, it was lights out. So that's oh, I, that's been my athletic career in a nutshell. I'm constantly look being proactive. I'm always looking for the edges. Maybe you're going to, you know, our family motto is it's not where you start, it's where you finish. And my daughters take it very seriously, very seriously, much more serious than even I do. And I'm, I'm a psychopath and they take it a lot more serious than I take it. So it, I don't care if my first discus throw was two feet behind the ring. And, and that's what we learned. Learned the Olympic list from Dick Notmeyer when I got out of college. Put on 40 pounds in four months, clean, no drugs, just good old fashioned. Lots of lifting. And then went off, I was the state champion in California, MVP, All American. Went off to Utah State. I was the MVP up at Utah State. Had a great coach, Mon, so the best career of any thrower ever, which was great because of throwing school. And then Started coaching the next fall in the weight room, and here we are in 2021, and I still love the discus. I still love the Olympic lifts. I still, you know, obviously my academics are something we could talk about another time, but, you know, I'm, I've always tried to keep a real balance between my academic success and my athletic success, and so here we are, yeah. How have coaches made an impact on you and your career and your success? Well, I mean, I wrote a book about it called 40 Years with the Whistle, and uh, I've had a few people read it and it's like, uh, it is, it's a love story to my mentors. You know, the word mentor, I always capitalize it because Telemachus, you know, uh, Ulysses' son had a teacher and his name was Mentor. And so being a mentor is literally, you're named after a guy named Mentor. And that's why I take such, I, that's kind of something I'd love it in 2,000, 3,000 years if they were still referring to Dan. Dan said, you know, that'd be awesome. You know, the, if it became so normalized that it became a lowercase d, you know. So, yeah, my coach has completely changed my life. Uh, starting, I mean, starting my brothers, my dad and my sister, of course. And then my coaches in ninth grade changed. I mean, I write glowingly about the weightlifting program we did in the ninth grade. Uh, my high school football coach, Coach DeYoung, was fabulous. Mr. Jacobs, my biology teacher, shaped the way I look at things academically. Uh, coach Lahati, you at Skyline, believed in me. Uh, Coach Mon at Utah State, basically just before he died, mentioned that 
even though I never made it to the Olympics, I was one of his best athletes. Of course, the, the level of the Olympics in throwing had ri risen to a point that if you weren't born, great. And then, of course, my coach now, Dave Turner, is my Olympic lifting coach. And, you know, Mike Brown is my training partner. I still, you know, when I look at what I write about my coaches, you know, I, I like the point that somebody said that it's a love affair. It's a love story to my mentors. And I, and I can't speak highly enough about them. Yeah. I think one of the, I've read a number of, a number of your books and some of these are going to come up from different books and some of them might've been repeated yeah. a couple of different times, but the, one of the ones that you highlighted is how a, an athlete with a number of fast twitch muscle fibers, if they're born in Canada, probably going to grow up playing ice hockey yeah. or that same athlete who grows up in Texas might play football or they might, yeah. they might wrestle. Uh, Iowa wrestler, a uh, Bulgaria yeah. Olympic lifter. Yeah. So how has technology given you, uh, how does technology start to change that game a little bit? Because now you can start to see things that you may not have had the same experience. Okay. You're going to be, dis you're going to be very disappointed. Oh, good. Uh, I'm ready. Uh, you know, you know, I go to these college campuses, pro teams and I, and I work with them and, and I'm impressed, you know, I'm at practice not long ago and the drone. So five guys come out and they're, they're the drone team. They get the drone to fly up so they can watch bird's eye view of the whole practice. And they got G the athletes have got GPS monitors in their shirts back here to see exactly how much they run. And it's like, that's great. And it's all stuff that a normal coach would have not needed. I'd spend the money on something else. I mean, you know, making sure they go to bed at night would be far more important with most athletes. Technology certainly has its place, but a good eye and five minutes of just you know what Earl Nightingale used to talk about, you know, get out a pad and paper and write some things down and, and think for God's sakes, you know, and I, I love technology. I mean, look, we're, we're having, a, I think is a zoom call, but we're on a, I mean, this is magic. This is the freaking Jetsons when I was young. Okay. You know, th this is, and it's so normal and, and no one notices it. And that's the problem with technology is it's amazing at first. And then it just gets, well, of course we're going to do that. And sometimes it becomes a little bit too, of course, we're going to do that. And, you know, and I'll get, I'll get people will send me videos and of their technique and the throws or the lifts and stuff. And it's like, God, you know, how come you don't have someone real time helping you? Because of the time I wake up, look at the video, make my comments, get them back to you. Oh, well, that's kind of amazing to even say this, but that was 18 hours old, you know, uh, back in the day, you know, I was getting ready for a weightlifting meet one time here and I was sending letters back to coach uh, Dick Notmar. And he'd send the letter back as soon as he got it. So, you know, there was an eight-day lag. So by the time I got the letter back, I, I was already a, a week ahead doing something else. Yep. And I laughed because I thought that was just fine, the eight-day lag. And there is a talk of technology there. It's called a stamp and a letter. And, a, and, you know, you had to handwrite and you had to write things, you know. But I just think you have to – I always put caveats on technology. For two reasons. One, once you've seen it, it's not as exciting anymore. Once you go to a facility and like I go to these high end, you know, these powerful football programs, college, and every athlete, when they come in to work out, they have an iPad and the iPad tells them the whole workout and it tells them the rep structure and what the heart rate should be. And, and to be honest, then I find out, well, how far did you throw? And then do you want to, I'll give you just feet just for, I throw 145. I go, well, you know, I threw 190 and we didn't have any of this crap. Because you're so worried about tempo, you're not worried about trying to win. You talk about you do sales or something, right? Yeah, right. It's, I mean, it's still, you have to have a good product. The product has to sell itself. And you just are a conduit between the, the product and the, sell, and the person buying the product. And if you think you're going to, I mean, you can fake, you can fool some of the people some of the time. In fact, in my world, fitness, it, it is, it's a given. That is, it's a shuckster, hikester, shyster industry. You know, it is the fitness world has been. I mean, I can go back a hundred plus years and tell you what you think in the West is yoga is just a bunch of nonsense. That my friends who've done yoga to say this is not yoga. This is the supplement stuff. The nonsense. Of, you know, it's funny because a friend of mine says, you know, still the best fat loss supplement is still rat poison. He goes, but you got to dose it right. 
And it's a joke. But by the way, there's truth in that, but it's in the dosing, you know? Well, I, I mean, I just think about the kind of crap that I put in my body over time. Whether it was like an ephedrine, caffeine, aspirin, snack. Ooh, that's actually pretty back. good. Yeah. We're like way, way back. And then, yeah. and then, and I remember the days when I would walk around with a gallon jug of water because I always had to stay hydrated and, you know, because I was taking in Again, too much creatine. And then I remember- Again, it- the amount of protein, like yeah. I can go a couple hours without having some protein. And it just, it's, we're compelled to chase after the thing that's on the other side of the wall or this other corner, because we think it's going to be this quick fix, or it's going to yeah. be this trick, or it's going to be this whatever. And Co- we almost Coach for- Mon, Okay. Let's go back to, let's go back to fall of 1977. Coach Mon, I say, Coach, what's the secret to throwing the discus far? He says, lift weights three days a week, throw the discus four days a week for the next eight years. And what everybody misses is that last little tiny thing, eight years. And eight years, if you did what I told, okay, you want to lose body fat. Okay, for the next eight years, I want you to sleep eight or nine hours every night, water and you know non-caloric beverages only. I want you to eat vegetables and protein at every meal and eat fermented foods as appropriate. That'll take care of most of it. I want you to, like I just read someone going, this miracle program. His trainer has him walk 16,000 steps a day, plus lift weights five days a week. Well, yeah, no kidding. You're going to get 16,000 steps a day. You know, when I'm in Europe and I walk around everywhere, I get 14,000 on a long, hard day. 16 grand for steps. That's a lot of steps. You know, what am I at today? I'm at, I don't measure steps, but I, I use it as part of my online education. What okay. I'm teaching people. Yep. But I mean, 16 large, that's for me, that would be, that'd be nine, 10 miles of walking every day. Yeah. Well, if you walk 10 miles every day and you lift weights five days a week and you sleep nine hours a week and you eat veggies and protein in every meal, yeah, you're gonna in eight years, you know. If you don't make progress, then we have to have a whole other discussion about DNA and maybe you just lost the genetic lottery. Kindly, we would say you suck. You just flat out suck. I wish I could say it nicer, but you you do. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. One of the things that the other th- or another one of the many things that I'm I has really interested me in your work is getting back to the basics, like mm. things like just doing a traditional a farmer carry, loaded carry, and the importance of hinging movements. Mm. These are all basic movements that we do as kids, as infants. And I, I think there's a another quote that you've got out there, and I forget if it was somebody, a story that you were sharing that someone else had conveyed to you, but it was the whole idea of if you can get away from someone. So that's more of like the crawl, move, run. If you can pick up some things, and you, uh, just based on your nonverbal, you you know where I'm going. So can you, will you complete that and help people kind of understand what kind of movement patterns are important as we simplify the work yeah. that we're doing? This uh, would go back to the original work of uh, it's French. So it's, we would say George Herbert, but it's Herbert. Okay, and uh, he was on a ship pulling up to a volcano, and he began to make he began to notice who survived this island volcan- uh, volcanic I- eruption. And what he noticed is that if you're living on an island, knowledge of swimming seems to help you survive. If you're living, if you got to crawl over, crawl under, sprint, you're a lot more likely to survive. And it is still the foundation of at least the way most of us, uh, I, I, when I, in the world of that I belong to, that is his foundational stuff. Mm -hmm. With my students, I used to teach them how to fight. We talked about carrying stuff for, you know, distance. We talked about, you know, uh, I mean, it's great, you know, here in the West, we got all those survival nuts and, you know, they all got all their machine guns and stuff. But really what's far more important to long-term survival is, I mean, if you have sunflower seeds, uh, sunflowers, bound together by beans with squash growing below them to protect them because the three of them work synergistically. Uh, Sunflowers, beans, and the squash family work Mm -hmm. together synergistically to survive. Well, if you have enough sunflower seeds, enough beans, a variety of squashes, access to fresh water, I don't care if that guy 100 miles away has a machine gun, you're probably going to be okay. 
so you just have to constantly outthink, you know, and outwit. It kind of sounds like a start of a TV show. Yeah. So that's that, those are the basics. When I break things down, I break them down in two ways, if you don't mind, Mike. Yeah. Uh, I break the weight room down as push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry. Okay. So that's the weight yep. room exercises. Mm -hmm. But then in when I coach at the next level, then we, okay, so let's take care of that. Okay. Do those five things in a variety of ways. Okay. But then the next thing is I break them down. It's called levels. And so do you ever train face down on the ground, which is called prone? Do you ever train on your back? Do you ever roll? Do you ever tumble? Do you ever do cartwheels? Have you ever hung from a bar? Do you know how to monkey bar? Break, it's called breaking monkey bar. There's walking, but there's also sprinting, which is different. And then, of course, it comes down to when the 2002 Olympics were here, I was an administrator, so I had to go to all these with the Red Cross, these disaster preparation stuff. And it's weird because the more disaster prep stuff you go to from someone you can trust, like the Red Cross, not the lunatics, you know, one of the things they talked about is you don't really need to store water. You have enough water, fresh recycled water in your hot water heater to keep you going for a long time. Usually you have about 150 gallons of fresh recycled water, not stored in plastic, which is going to, you know, which not, might not be potable after a few days. The other thing they said is, if you have a way to get 90 miles away from where you are, universally, that will make you survive. Well, I have a bicycle with no gears, with a coaster brake, and I got a backpack, and I got another thing in there. So I have this backpack with that I bought for $20 that has food and water and some basic supplies for four people for three days. With that backpack and my little cruiser bicycle and if i come to a hill i'll just push the bike up the hill it'll be terrible going up the hill be wonderful going down the hill i'm pretty sure i can get 90 miles i think i could probably do it in a day if not i have a survival a little survival sleeping bag and we all know statistically that if you survive three days in a disaster generally you survive generally i mean there are obviously there's always an asterisk but i mean what I just told you there, it gets us back to George Herbert. So, can now we have a listener go going? Well, that's really interesting. Well, gentle listener, do you know how to ride a bike? Well, no, I don't. So, do you want to wait until the disaster hits to learn how to ride a bike, or would you rather learn the bike how to ride the bike today? The old, the, the great uh, story I quoted a lot. It, I always, I always heard it came from India, but I won't waste the whole time. But you know, when's the best time to learn how to, you know? to swim well, before the boat sinks. Sure. Yeah. And so, so much of general life is just these basic, simple, kind of like stuff you should have learned by the time you're five, six, seven, eight, just stuff you should know. I mean, I took judo as a kid and I learned how to tumble and I teach every one of my athletes how to tumble because at my age, the most dangerous thing in my house is the floor. You know, the floor can kill me. In fact, I just talked to a friend, literally, let's see, it's three. It would have been about two hours ago, I bumped into her, and her mom fell and broke her hip. And of course, we know what, once you fall at a certain age and break the hip, the clock starts ticking on when we're going to put you in the ground. And I didn't say it to this person, because that's never something you want to hear. But for me, the most dangerous thing I can do is slip and hit the ground hard. So if I slip and I tumble... You know, there's a chance, uh, yeah, I might get bruised. I might feel crappy for a couple of days, but I might not, I won't break anything. And that keeps that, my timeline where I want it to be. And the thing that is fascinating to me, but also frustrating at the same time is we tend to, whether it's in fitness and that's not my area of expertise, other than I'm a gym rat and I can do the meathead movements. And, mm -hmm. you know, so any of the meathead movements, I'm really, I'm, I'm really good at. And that was the that was kind of the extent of how how I would lift. And now I've kind of shifted after reading some of your stuff and Alan Cosgrove stuff and Pavel's stuff. And you get into, it's amazing what you can do with a kettlebell and mm -hmm. how you can really put yourself through some, some, a really good workout with a simple piece, uh, a simple piece of equipment. But it seems like when we're leading others, whether leading in fitness or leading in business, we lose sight of the basics and get caught up in this what's new, this what's next. And what it feels like is we just can, we kind of chase that next what's new, that's what's that next what's next. When if we actually spent more time and focused on the fundamentals, we would put ourselves in a much better position to be successful. Is that 
fair? That's you just just that's everything. That's my whole. That's all I know is what you just said. That's all I know. If you come and train with me, like today I did squat, clean, front squat, press, push up, oh, uh, hanging leg raises, and then a walk. Now, maybe the Olympic lift the squat clean is fancy, but nothing I did. A normal person watching me train would be like, yeah, that's, that's, that's the 1960s workout. Right. And it worked really well in the 1960s, and it works really well in 2021. So my workouts are, I mean, push-ups and overhead presses. I mean, push-ups. I don't know if there's anything more boring than push-ups. Front squats, you know, we hold the weight here. I mean, it's, it keeps my body upright. It's good for my mobility and flexibility. And there's just, and then I go for a walk after. There's nothing fancy there. There's nothing, you know, you're not going to come in there and go, holy cow, where did you come up with these? And it's weird because I will do the workshop and people go, where do you come up with this? And I'm like, how do you not know? I mean, I'm going to take your money, but how do you not know? How do you not know this stuff? You know, it's just, and I, sometimes I'll get, well, Dan, we don't have your experience. And it's like, well, you know, just above me, that, those, that's, those are all the strength and health magazines. And these are a whole bunch of oh, those books are mine and uh, in different languages. And, but my whole house is covered with books from the 1960s. There's Tommy Kono's book. There's nothing new under the sun here. The stuff I was taught at Utah State in the throws is far better than the crap the kids learn today. Far better. Yeah, I can tell you, I've wasted a lot of time. I probably on a preacher curl bench when I, when I was a when I was a kid. I don't know that that was really anything more. Anything, I, I mean, I would have been in better shape had I just done pull ups. And, pull ups. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Chin ups. You know, hands this way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So when people start to think about getting back to basics and just kind of basic fundamentals mm -hmm. and 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 continuously improving on the fundamentals. How does that translate from what you've seen in high performing athletes who this is what they do and just getting back into the fundamentals? How do they maintain a level of focus on doing the things that are really boring but are extremely important to the their ability to to yeah. be productive? How do they keep that level of focus? And maybe it's discipline is the, is the right word, but where do they, where's the discipline come from? The focus come from oh, when things well, get okay, tough. There's, okay. There's okay, you got two different things you're asking. Make sure okay. we'll separate yep. them out. First, I can't remember which book I put in 40 years or attempts, but I did it because I wanted people to see these three names. It was Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, and Kobe Bryant. And all three of them said, I spend more time on the fundamentals than my opponents. Basically, they all said the same thing. And that's why I win. I mean, that's a pretty good list of basketball players, okay? And they all said the exact same thing. This idea, discipline is an interesting word, but we won't worry about it now. It's just this recognition that it's very difficult for Americans because we're always looking for the shiny, bright little object, you know? And the truth is, I mean, you know, I mean, the people, I, I look at the fitness industry and I still am amazed at like, why the Kardashian sisters are considered leaders in the fitness industry. They've obviously had plastic surgery because it's clear that they have. They also do a lot of strange things. And why are we letting Hollywood, you know, I mean, if you've ever met someone from Hollywood, and I have, and I'm not going to rip on this guy because I have great respect for Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump. I've met yeah. him because, you know, he and I work in the, in the same circles. But I towered over this guy, towered over him. And you know, why are, we, why are we paying attention to a lot of, and, and Hollywood actors are genetic freaks. You know, that the one young lady, Isla something or other, you know, she's like 4'10", weighs like 80 pounds. Like, that's just not a, that's not the kind of people, women I generally spend, hang around. The, kind of a, these, they're freak, just like NBA guys are freaks of nature. I make this joke all the time. Few people get it. But when I work at the NBA, the elevators smell different. We'll let you think about that joke, gentle listener, and we'll come back to it. They're just taller than I'll ever be. I was down at uh, Southern Methodist University this last week, and I was working with the strength guys. And my God, their tight ends are all six, 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 seven, six, eight now. And they've got a bunch of them. I used to be big. Now I'm a shrimp. It's, so we got to be careful because why are we following the outliers when it comes to things like fitness and perfor even performance? When it comes to performance, I just read a funny thing last night, and I can't validate it. I just read it. But the average age of professional bodybuilder, male bodybuilder dying is 47 years old. Wow. And, you know, I've got a whole collection of books over there down that hall. Uh, my good friend, Lurie Draper, her husband is Dave Draper, the 
famous mm-hmm. bot, the blonde bomber. And so, yep. they, so Dave and I are good friends, but Lori and I are very good. So she sends me all these books. And the hardest thing about you read these bodybuilder books is that they're all dead. They're all dead. So, and you know, your son, he wants to play professional basketball and he's 5'10". Well, he's not going to make it. He's not tall enough. Right. You know, he's just, I mean, I'm not a jerk. It, and if your daughter who's, you know, six foot four says, you know, she wants to be a, a TV show, ain't going to happen. She's too tall. You know, I met Arnold when the, uh, I was at the opening in San Francisco when uh, Pumping Iron came out. If he's six two, I'm six eight. <laughs> and I, you know, and I've heard you can't even get a picture with Sylvester Stallone because he won't do it. I'm trying to make a point. I don't know how well I'm making it. But my point is, you got to be really careful about who you follow. I mean, oh. are you willing, anyone's listening for fitness, and longevity, or health advice, are you willing to get plastic surgeries and ingest drugs that will shorten your life to get your fitness goals? And here's the thing. And if you want to, like you mentioned, ephedrine. Ephedrine, man, was a wonderful drug, except for men, because you it made you look good, except you'd need Viagra to do anything because ephedrine had massive impact on the male sexual act. So you look like a million dollars and you perform like uh, my poor old puppy right here who came in and fell asleep and snored next to me, who's been cut since day one. I mean, do you want, I mean, do you want to be buried at 47? It's like, what, what, what trade-offs are you willing to make? Right. And is that, and, and why are those things important? The- exactly. People ask me, you know, I work out, I work out every day. Now, when I say I work out, Three days a week, I lift weights. I Olympic lift and do uh, I so I Olympic lift and then I bodybuild because uh, I think that's what you need at my age. And then I always walk. Olympic lift, bodybuild, walk. Two days a week, about an hour of mobility work called original strength and uh, half an hour, 45 minutes, depends. And then I walk. And then two days a week, I just kind of saunter. I go out and enjoy life. Well, Dan, because you're trying to look good? No, because I want to be around for my granddaughter Josephine's wedding. My goal, now, people in my family, we die young, and it breaks my heart to say this. I was at a workshop in England about, it was two years ago, and I said, people in my family die young, and a person came up to me, literally at the break, and said, you know, you shouldn't talk like that about your family dying young. I didn't know at the time, but my brother Phil had just died. Mm. And uh, he's, he's, well, I'm his age now, you know. And for me to make it, you know, Leo's upstairs yelling, that's my eight-month-old, he just... For me to make it to him getting his driver's license means I have to make it to age 80, something no one in my family's done. Between wow. America's wars, cancer, and life, we don't live. Well, my brother Rich is going to make it, I think, to 76. He gets the mantles, the longest living one of us. Every, every time he hits a birthday, he wins. He scores scoreboards, the rest of us. You know, this, the, this year was the 30th anniversary of my dad's death, the 41st anniversary of my mom's death. So as I rush those things past my mind, I think to myself, you know, I don't want Danny, Josephine, Leo to be asking questions, you know, pick up a picture of me, you know, just pull out a picture of me and say, who is this guy? You know, oh, that was your grandpa, Dan. You know, I don't, I don't want that. You know, I don't want that. I want to live. Longevity, of course, is, is an issue of quantity and quality. And I have a, a dear, uh, someone I care, care a lot about who uh, is going through uh, dementia at a very, very early age, a decade younger than me. Mm. And it's caused by something. The person is DNA and some choices combined. Do you want to be in your 50s with dementia? Do you want to be a, you know, I just finished, uh, visited my friend Dave just before I, we came on today. And I love Dave, but he, you know, he really hurt himself badly in a motorcycle accident. You know, you have to to weigh these things and you have to constantly say, just like I would as a head coach, you know, there's, there's cost to benefit ratios on my podcast. I get these, I get questions like, Dan, should I go heavy on this? And I'll say, no, I don't think you should. And then I'll get all these responses. You know, I did this and I did that. Well, you know what? Up yours. I don't care (laughs) because there's a cost to benefit ratio here. Right. One of the guys who comes to my gym hurt himself badly doing a heavy Turkish getup. And I think that's the stupidest, this, that would be the stupidest phrase I can say out loud at this second. I'll come up with something stupider in a minute. You hurt yourself doing an exercise that no one cares about. Yeah. No one cares about Turkish get-ups. I hurt my back a couple of years ago. And the only thing I could go back to that I did was I was listening to a 
I forget who it was, but it was, um, it was the guy who's, I think it was the guy who's over at Nike was on a Tim Ferriss podcast and he was talking about doing Jefferson curls. And I did, so I did a loaded Jefferson curl with a 45, with 135 pounds. So 45s on each side on a plyo box and the absolute stupidest thing that I've ever done in. Oh, don't sell yourself short. Thing. Don't sell yourself <laughs> short. You've <laughs> yeah, done dumber I things. I had, to, I had to crack my, from a gym perspective, like that, like I had no business doing that. It made no sense to allow my back to arch that way. It's not the technique that I've grown up. You it just, it didn't make any sense. And to this day, I still get that same, I still have that same pain that comes in and, and revisits me from time to time on the you know, lower left side of my back because I was doing something stupid. It wasn't worth the benefit. And I don't even remember what the benefit was that I thought I was going to get out of doing that thing. But I knew like technique wise and anybody who's ever deadlifted anything. So a Jefferson curl is kind of like a, a stiff legged version of a deadlift where you, if you saw somebody doing that in the gym, you'd go up and tap them on the shoulder and say, please don't do that anymore. You're going to hurt yourself. Yeah. That's how I hurt my back. And so yeah. when I'm doing my podcast on my own podcast, I'm answering questions and I come up with this constantly and I get such pushback, but it's like, I started lifting weights and this is no, this is not, a, I started lifting weights in 1965. I started taking them a lot more serious in 1970. It has opened every door in my life. I have done a lot of stupid things. I've been injured. And here's the thing. I'm fine with getting injured in competition. Mm. I've been hurt. Olympic lifting in competition. I got hurt real bad playing American football. I got hurt doing this and that. But when I hurt myself doing something that I can't defend, and it was interesting, I did this workshop. I was talking to the Southern Methodist coaches, and one of the coaches came up after. He goes, you know, you said this thing, and it just leaped out to me. And it's like, I knew what you're talking about in the push-pull hinge squat loaded carry. I understood your concept of levels. I understood everything. But when you said, can you defend it? So when I'm work, putting a program together with somebody, I'm just, this is my just, just, just pretense. So I'm working with you, uh, Mike, and uh, push, pull, hinge, squat, load, carry. So you got that back injury. So we're going to slide you. Instead of doing this, we're going to do hip thrusts because hip thrusts are a lot easier in the lower back than this. And then at the end of it, I'll say, okay, let me explain to you why you're going to do one arm overhead presses with that bad back, okay? Because one limb supported by a whole trunk and two legs, a little safer. We're going to do TRX, or suspension trainer, yep. rows, Ys, and Ts, because that'll, that there'll be no pressure. We're going to do hip thrusts and we're going to, I'm going to teach you the goblet squat and then we're going to move to the overhead squat. And you'll be like, the overhead squat, I need a lot of flexibility for that. And I'll go, nah. And then we're going to do suitcase and farmer walks. And I'm going to probably have you do some hill sprints because that's, there's be no loading on your lower back on hill sprints. Defended everything. This is making this up, but yeah. I just defended everything I just said. And if you get hurt and it happens, uh, training with me, and it could happen, I'll be able to say, okay, here's why we picked the ty, uh, the uh, the y exercise. You know, this, and maybe a, a physio, the physical trainer, a surgeon might say, oh, okay, that makes sense. Okay, what I didn't know is that this problem had, you know. The prop, you know, the, the leg bones connected to the ankle bone, the ankle bones connected to the hip bone, the hip bones connected to, you know, that. I've heard the song. Yeah. So you have this injury over here, yeah. but over time, that injury had, you know, kind of cancered itself into a whole bunch of other places because that's what happens with good injuries. You know, you, you break a toe and all of a sudden your lower back hurts. You know, you tweak your knee and your shoulder goes out. And by the way, gentle listener, that happens a lot more than you think. If you want to really mess up your kid's throwing arm, put them in really, really tight shoes and get a bunion or or break a break a toe and their throwing motion will go to hell. It is. Um, and I, I think it was Alan Cosgrove. It might have been Mark Verstegen. I forget where I first started using a TRX, but I had no idea that a single arm, single leg pull could fire my glutes. And I didn't understand how that would functionally work, but I've always, I've had a problem with getting my glutes to fire, doing, you know, just things that are a little bit more quad heavy kind of stuff. And I'm sure there are a lot of people out there thinking, wow, we've really gone a little bit too deep into discussions around no, fitness. But that's gentle, hold up, gentle listener here. I'll just tell you to do it. <laughs> so I want you to stand on your left foot and then take your right hand and don't worry about the right leg. Just let it swing away. Take your right hand and touch your shoelaces and try to hold that as long as you can. 
Just do it once and tell me about the next day where you feel it. Because it'll get you sore as hell. It, because most people don't use their glutes. That's why. And it's fascinating what happens when you can actually get them to fire and mm. you feel what happens when they, when they fire and you start to realize how important the chain is. And, yeah. and with that chain and the, the tie in as we go, but kind of back into the, the business and the, and broader execution pieces, the things that we do, similar to what Dan had talked about before, the actions that you take have consequences. The actions that you take have consequences. They will impact other things in the chain. I ran into an issue a couple, about a year ago. I was just walking the golf course a lot, playing a lot of golf, walking every day, wearing the same pair of vans in 110, 115 degree heat. So not a lot of uh, breathability in those shoes. And I got just this nasty case of athlete's foot and debilitating to the point where the pain was so hard what I would plant on my follow through that I was trying to overcompensate with something else. Mm -hmm. And I knew two, three holes into it, I I quit. I walked off the course because I was going to do too much damage to my knee because of my knee on my other leg, because I was trying to Mm -hmm. protect something on the other side. So be careful about what you focus on and what you do, because it does have consequences as you go through it. I mean, just, I just see it with a bad night's sleep. I mean, it takes one bad night's sleep. And uh, it throws, I mean, as an Olympic lifter, a bad night's sleep will throw the timing off. And so you have to, if you look horrible coming in, you know, you broke up with your girlfriend, you, I don't know, a million, you had to take your kid to the airport at four in the morning to go to Hawaii. And we're not going to Olympic lift today. Today, we're going to do front squats and we're going to do, you know, we're going to do stuff that doesn't have a lot of high-end neurological stuff going on. Stuff is a very important phrase as a coach here, folks. You know, it's got to be, you got to ratchet it down a little bit. You know, you're absolutely right. How important is recovery? So like when you're talking about ratcheting down, like how important is recovery in just in life? Like you mentioned earlier about if you want, if you want to burn body fat, get eight hours of sleep for a per night for eight years in a row. Like what's the recovery? recovery? So you know, Maffy Tone does a great job with this. You know, training plus recovery equals progress. Okay. And where I see most people drop the ball is on recovery. It's easy to train hard. It's hard to recover hard. So I want you to be the most, and, and I, I have this phrase I tell people, normal people, I say, tomorrow, we're going to have the hardest workout of your life. And it's going to be so brutal. We're just going to go after it. Push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded, carry, and we're just going to go to the max. But today. I want you to move better. I want you to feel better. And then when we get to tomorrow, I, we say, okay, tomorrow, you're going to have the hardest workout of your life. You're going to do this, this, and this. And, when to- and literally, tomorrow never comes. Every day, I want you to move better, feel better. It feels good to feel good. And if you move good, you look good. Somebody told me I go to quit saying good all the time. And it's like, well, shut up. You know, I'm a Fulbright scholar. So the recovery, uh, so let's see, just looking around. So, okay, here's a recovery tool. I mean, here's one. This is my little uh, neck one. You know, they vibrate. You know, it's that one. Uh, you yeah. know, I've got a, a sleep mask over there because I meditate every morning. Just outside that door right there is, is a sauna. My walks are recovery walks, even though they also burn fat. They, they're recovery walks. I do attempt to try some supplements to see if that will aid in recovery. But the best supplements I know for recovery are water. Protein, veggies, same supplements I would tell you to take for fat loss or muscle gain. But it's, you know, okay, I'll tell you a good example. Yesterday, I did, I did a really long sauna yesterday. And I have uh, skin lotion in there. And I've got, I have a, a <laughs> so I've got this, that's getting powered up. There's my Bluetooth speaker that I, I have to repower it up. It goes for a long, long time and then it dies. And then sometimes I'll listen to something motivating, like something from Earl Nightingale. And sometimes I'll just listen to music, but I spend time in there. And with the lotion, I kind of try to rub those parts. I actually look for hot spots in my body. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I know when I'm training right is I can go through all the areas. Uh, For me, as an Olympic lifter, this this area can get a little bit hot. When I was a thrower, it'd be right there. I mean, that's it right there. I could touch it right now. It's still... I started throwing the discus in 1970. So I got, you know, 41 years of damage in there. 40. No, 
not 50, 51 years. Okay. You can hold. So you can hold. Yeah, as, 51, as years of, 51 years of discus throwing in there. So, you know, that's, but that's more, I mean, I can tell I'm right into the joint there, but I can probably do some soft tissue work and, and I just explore. I just kind of explore and touch things and I try to gently rub them out every so often. I don't like masseuses, no offense to them, but that hour and 15 minutes is not near enough time to cover everything. I love pedicures, especially a place we have over here in Murray, because they do a, a long, besides the fact that I think the care of your nail beds is an underappreciated area for health. You know, if you get an infection here, every time your heart beats, it goes throughout your whole body. If you get an infection here because you don't floss your damn teeth, yeah. every time your heart beats, it goes around your whole body and it destroys your cardiovascular system. You can run a marathon every day, but if your teeth are in terrible shape, you can't outrun all that crap going through your heart, through your cardiovascular system every beat. So take care of your nail beds. So one of the ways, the ways I do it, Every so often, I get a, a, a pedicure, toenail, you know, tails fixed. Sure, yeah. But then they also spend quality time rubbing my calves. And that's when I realize how much I carry stressfully in my calves <laughs> because I walk so damn much, yeah. I don't notice it. So they'll reach and they'll go like this. Well, okay, that's good. That's good. What is the, what is the trigger point stuff actually do? So for someone who's saying, okay, we're talking about massage, we're talking about Finding some of those points, whether it's in your shoulder, you're talking about yeah. the, just the distance. We're dancing sort of. on voodoo right now, Mike. Is it? I think the body inflames in different reasons for a whole bunch of reasons. For example, the biggest mistake you can make when you do an exercise is the next day say, oh, I'm sore here. So it must be working that muscle. We just like shin splints, we have no idea. We still have no idea what DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness actually is, except so for me, it's like saying, well, what causes, you know, delayed onset muscle soreness? Well, exercise. Well, see, yeah, we know that because it was in, almost in the definition. We still don't have a good answer about what shin splints are. We don't know what they are. And someone will say, you're going to get someone going, well, I read a thing that says is this. Really? Well, my PT, the guy who comes every Thursday, he says, oh, yeah, it's a rare week that someone doesn't come out conclusively and state what it is, and it doesn't follow up the next week, so. But trigger points, this idea. Now, there are two that we now, and I reason is this any, if you've never bench pressed before, Dick Notmeyer, my coach, but take this and he just jab you right oh, there. Yeah, there. right there. And, and if, you're, for, if you're listening to the podcast, but basically, if you've ever done this with a bench press or push a lot of push it's right in between your shoulder and your upper chest or your upper pack. If yeah. like there's that point and you know it because yeah. you felt it there, if yeah. you were going to work. Yeah. But it's also near one of the major places of the lymphatic system. It's also a traffic jam of muscles in there because, because when we decided to go upright and start throwing things, I mean, I guess some people have their mid hamstring as a trigger point. Okay. So if you take your thumb and drive it into someone's mid hamstring, yeah. almost universally the ankles, I mean, uh, the calf, I'm sorry, the calf muscles will have a few spots and often there's a trigger and you know how the the foot has three arches. You got the toe arch right in the middle. Okay, so right behind the toe arch, and there's like a little spot there that just oh, makes most yeah. people jump. It could simply be that these are just loud places neurologically. And I guess I probably shouldn't have said trigger point. What I mean is that pain, those knots. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Like where, where you start to, you, you, where you yeah. feel them. Like, you know, for me, I've had uh, shoulder challenges and yeah. I've had a couple of different shots in the shoulder. And in hindsight, I wish I never would have done never, that yeah. because never. when I found out that actually rolling out my infospinatus, I think is what it's called, it <laughs> made a huge difference in shoulder pain. And I thought, well, how the heck does rubbing, rolling something out of my back ultimately impact the front of my shoulder? It and you, but it does. It was amazing. So. I went and did every, every year I go to, a, okay. So I, every year I go to an annual physical three times a year, I go to the dentist one time a year, I go to the eye doctor. Cause that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. But I also do one other thing that not everyone does. I go to Mike, my physical therapist every year, and he walks me through a whole scan. I think it cost me $152 or something like that. Yeah, It's like stealing. So this last year, this exercise, for those of you listening, I'm just basically doing a, an official doing a touchdown. Okay. I go like this, I shrug. In fact, it just popped again. I heard it. You know, I pop it up <laughs> yeah. and that's it. 
that's $152 worth of knowledge I just gave you because that is the exercise that relieves my issue in my shoulders. That's but awesome. when the hand goes up in the back, yes. Well, what about this? That's very good. That didn't help my shoulder. But uh, yes, yes. Over there in the, in the blue, yes. No, that didn't help me. No, thank you. No, that didn't help. What helped me by going to somebody who knew their stuff, they gave me one exercise that I do every day. I also hang. I hang okay. uh, as part of my, mo- I hang for 30 seconds and I do a, I sit at the bottom of the goggle squat for 30 seconds. That's my one minute mobility thing. And then I do that exercise. Sometimes it pops. Mm, it's popping less and less and less. But uh, that's why you, you don't just go to someone who's going to, you know, test your chakras and see if your yin is in line with your yang. You go to somebody who knows your stuff. Oh, by the way, goblet squat. Do you know what a goblet squat is? I do. Yeah. Who, I, who invented that? I have no. Did you invent the goblet squat? Yeah. I, I, come on now. That was a softball. That's awesome. So uh, goblet squat. If you think about picking up a kettlebell mm-hmm. and you you can turn it upside down and hold, hold it so your handles are down and the ball is up. You keep uh, everything. Uh, 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 the inventor disagrees with you. Oh, don't do that. Okay. So the hold inventor the says no. Hold, hold the, the actual hold the Wait. horns. Don't flip it upside down. No, there's a funny Why? story about that. One of my interns who, let's just say, supplemented with herbs every night, <laughs> uh, went to a very famous gym and the guy said, Explain the goblet squat. He got it wrong. But one of the first pictures ever of a goblet squat was wrong. And that's why it stuck. That is awesome. So, okay. So from the inventor, use the handles or the horns on the kettlebell the way that they're intended. Keep that kettlebell up nice and tight and just sit back into your squat position. Push your knees out with your elbows. Push your knees out with your elbows. Pushing your knees out with your elbows actually is what I say is the goblet squat. So what does pushing your knees out with your elbows do for you? Have you done it? I have. Right now. Right now. So just push them out. Gentle listener, he's pushing his knees out with his elbows. It opens up my hips a bit more and actually and? My, back, my back crack. And actually, oh. my, you know, what's, what's awesome, and I don't know if it's because, this is really helping because I'm out of the microphone, but I don't know if it was because I had my back up against the wall, but I actually had better stability and was able to keep my heels yeah. on the ground better there. So than it I comes usually. down to this. The human body is not on the legs. The human body is slung between the legs. Okay. So when you push your knees out, you have to be in a slung position, not what I call the accordion position, which hurts your knees. Bent over. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Uh, so the knees, you want your knees out so you can sit between them. Yep. And that way you don't feel it in your knees at all, unless you're 64 years old and you're doing the Olympic lifts on a cold, cold Utah morning. And if anybody's struggling to picture what this looks like, you think of Dan's eight-month-old in just a couple of months as he's walking around, if he's not already walking, but where he just sits there and is playing with things with his rear end down to his ankles. And it just is a, that's a comfortable position. At some point in time, that was your comfortable position. It may not necessarily be your comfortable position today, but you can get back there. Yeah. Yeah. So that, you know, a lot of this stuff that I teach there's a lot of exercises. In fact, I don't know what your your listenership is like. Yeah. There's a good chance I invented a lot of the things their trainers are doing. So I'd like to talk about a couple of the exercises as we sure. as, as we wrap up. So you've talked about the importance of push, pull, loaded carry, hinge. What let's was go, the, let's, let's go in correct order. Push, hinge, pull. Yep. Hinge, squat, loaded carry. So let's talk about an exercise. And I know you've mentioned a couple of them that's gone through. What's a good example of a push exercise? Okay. Push is when you get your environment away from you. Okay. So in a fight, by the way, you will push and pull. Okay. But a push exercise is anytime the environment gets away from you. So if you're on the ground and and you push your hands into the ground, it's a push up. When you take a weight and put it overhead, it's called an overhead press. So for most of your listeners, they should probably press overhead especially if they're a North American audience. Overhead is, especially after, probably after about age 20, you might never want to do push-ups and bench press again. If you spend a lot of time at your desk leaned over, you definitely want to do overhead presses, no question. For pulls, pulls is when you embrace the environment. If the thing is above your head, you're bringing the environment closer. If it's here, you're bringing it to you. Why go above over the head instead of in front? In front yeah, because of most, well, first off, for athletic performance, bench press is almost worthless. But 
most North Americans have really tight pectoral muscles and doing more push-ups and bench will just tighten them up even more. That's where they'll get, get that, that kind of hunch yeah. where yeah. the shoulders go. roll are rolling mm-hmm. over. So ah. get comfortable with the, with getting the shoulders back and doing yeah. more of a pull. Do you think about it the same way, Dan, when what pulling in that same plane, is it better to pull overhead? Yeah. To sit? Let me, now on the pull for most okay. North Americans, I haven't do the horizontal family. Okay. So the rows. Yep. And what I want on every row is I want you to put your thumbs in your armpit and pause for a second or two. Longer pausing with your thumbs in the armpit, even better. And with your thumbs in your armpit, if you even bring your elbows close together, what you'll do it for me right now. Put your thumbs in your armpits and now bring your elbows together. Oh, wow. Together. Yeah. Yep. What'd you notice? Tighten. I won't be able to name the muscles properly, but in, in, the middle, in the middle part of my back, my rhomboids are, are rhomboids. definitely tighter. So, They're more activated. Yep. When it comes to hinge, there's an exercise, Brett Contreras, really, I'm, I'm giving him full credit, even though it was around before, and there's no question. When I was at Olympic Training Center in 84, they taught us the pelvic tilt, which is the hip thrust, the glute bridge. But the hip thrust is probably the best hinge for most North Americans. And I can't describe it, so don't worry about it. Or a deadlift, a rack deadlift. I like the bar to be at least to either an inch below your knees or an inch above your knees when you deadlift. Uh, so you don't have to pull the weight from the floor. The bar is where it's at because of 1930s metallurgy. There's no logical reason for it to be that height. In the squat, I don't believe that the load of squatting is important. I think the movement of squatting is important. I squat every single day. I don't go heavy every single day, but for mobility. And honestly, if all your listeners did was the goblet squat, everyone would be happier in a few weeks. And then loaded carries, that's when you pick something up and you carry it. I've got a question on this, on the squat. And yeah. And we'll include, this will be one of those interesting ones where we'll include pictures and links to a number of different places so you can see these. Yeah, just, including- just link it up to my uh, YouTube channel. Yep, we will in the, huh. the show notes. So I started doing overhead squats. Um, oh, and overhead squats. Overhead squats. And really felt, one, it challenged some of my shoulder flexibility mm-hmm. as, I, as I was going through. But what I felt like I was doing, I felt like I was I had more comfort and more control in the movement than where I might've cheated with a traditional back squat. Why no, is that no. with the, okay. what's well, happening this is, Now this is something not everyone agrees with me, Mike, but I'm right. So let's move on. Perfect. I don't believe in uh, teaching the back squat at all. We start with the goblet squat. The next okay. exercise is the overhead squat. And then I go to the front squat. Okay. If the athlete needs more mass, then we go to the back squat for mass building. But if you start with the back squat, with the weight on your back, you'll never learn the front squat or overhead squat because you won't have the mobility and flexibility to pull it off. So when you do an overhead squat, it is a, it is total body tension that you can't hide from Mm -hmm. with back squats. I don't, I barely, I don't, do I even grip the bar when I back squat? (laughs) I might even have loose fingers, but overhead squat, I'm locked and loaded. If you talk to me while overhead squatting, I will swear at you after I get up off the ground because the bar knocked me down with back squats. I can carry on a conversation up to rep 30, you know? Yeah. I'm a huge so goblet squat, overhead squat, front squat. Why the progression to front squat after overhead squat? Well, because then you need to, it gives me some time to teach the flexibility of the wrists. Okay. Some people need it and some don't. I, Dick Notmeyer just went, this is the way you're going to do it. And so I was in pain every day for months until it just stopped. But Because my flexibility has disappeared in my shoulder and my wrist. I've gone to the, just kind of holding. Yeah, how old are you? Up in front, 47. Yeah, 47 was the best year of my career as a discus throw, by the way. So that, what you're saying is there's a chance? No, what I'm saying, I guess, is I'm 64 now. When is that flexibility going to come around? What year do you think? It, I have you know, no idea. It feels like it's getting worse and worse. <laughs> yeah, so, Mike, do you think this flexibility is suddenly going to get better when you're 60? <laughs> Probably not. No, it's not. So yeah. work on it today. Mobility, the free, you know, the free movement around a joint. Flexibility is a neurological trick. We don't care about it. But mobility goes so quick that's why i like exercises with built-in mobility work the overhead squat the front squat built-in mobility work actually the kettlebell swing built-in mobility work yeah so and i jumped in front of you i went back to the squat as you started talking about loaded carry when you talk about loaded carry what what should people envision what's what's a loaded carry well this comes from the family of carries i I came up with the term loaded carry because of the way we were doing them But then after that, loaded carries just became the the way we now say it in this field. So if you ever see the word loaded carry, that comes from something I wrote in 1999. And it just became part of our language. It's just funny. 
to me, a loaded carry is when you add something to a carry. So a heavy backpack or a sled or something like that. So if I have a sled around my waist, the cover of that book, okay, I'll have to fix my, that after. I don't know why anything fell. But if you, I, a gentle listener, I know you can't see it, but okay. You don't see there as I got a broken wrist, but I'm carrying a really heavy bag, dragging a sled in the snow. So that to me is what a loaded carry is. See, I thought so, that was sand. Only because I think of beach instead of instead of snow, I just wasn't paying attention. Uh, what, what, do you, what Dan's holding up is uh, uh, never let go. Uh, uh, okay. So a carry, the basic carries, th- these are the ones I'd recommend. The farmer walk, that's when you pick up two weights and you walk with them. You'd be surprised how strong you are, gentle listener. Sophomore girls in high school can do 85 pounds the first workout. I'll go to a gym and I'll see a guy using 20s and I'll be like, oh, what a waste of time. Uh, suitcase carry is when you just have it in one hand. According to Stu McGill, it's the best loaded carry there is for what it does to the back. From there, uh, there's also things in gyms now called prowlers. It's like basically it's like pushing a car, a broken car. And I think there's great value in it. And then, of course, I'm a big fan of carrying heavy bags because it builds up what I call anaconda strength, which is that internal pressure. And I'd be honest, if you don't know how to squat, just pick up a hundred pound bag, walk 10 feet, and then just do a squat. And I guarantee you'll squat perfectly if you're holding it like this. If I could do it all again, I don't know if I would have come up with a goggle squat because I'd have been doing the bear hug carry squats. Would you? Yeah, because in, uh, yeah, and the more, the more work I do with the military, the more I realize that it's just an easier way to teach squats. Just Would you have been able to push out your legs with your elbow in that kind of, like what I'm thinking? No, about. no, it doesn't matter because you, yes. No, oh, okay, stand right up. There. Yep. You, the weight's right there. You, well, right there, yeah. I can't, yeah you, I've, got to, I've got to get my knees extended. Out of the way. you got a bag coming down. and a, Well, you got a body coming down, so you got to get out of the way. Then, of course, from there, we can combine them in all kinds of different ways, do all kinds of interesting things. But, you know... There's a program I give to p- people. You, you hold a push-up position plank. You do some TRX, some suspension trainers, rows or T's. You do some hip thrust. You do some gobble squats. You do some farmer walks. And I tell people, you know, you will have the most successful clients in your area by doing those things. And they're like, well, what about all this fancy stuff? It's like, well, yeah, that's fine. But <laughs> it's like what the late coach Bojack told me. I was looking at where he ran the veer offense. and. And one day I said, what's the secret? Because I love asking, what's the secret? That's my, one of my favorite questions. Or what's the one thing? I love that too. He turned, he poked my chest like this, and he said, you, you're the problem. I go, what? He goes, yeah, you can't get bored. The athletes aren't getting bored. You know, we're going, you know, on a bad season with his team, they'd go nine and one, nine and two. They're not bored winning nine games. They love it. You know, they don't mind. It's weird. What He told me one time, his perfect game was 28 to nothing. A week later, he sought me out. He said, I was wrong. The perfect game is 21 to nothing. And we take a knee going into the end zone to finish off the game. Because in other words, he just, they got the ball. They ran through an entire quarter and you never touched it. You were three and out. They got the ball. They ran the ball down your throat for a quarter, halftime. You know, this idea that you try to get a team to only have two, three, four possessions in a game and win. Oh God, I love that stuff. So and you're, talk, you're talking to a guy who's an Arizona State fan whose team lost both times they were in Utah earlier this year because they just were not prepared to to go up and play up there. So the idea is I'm going to put my finger and thump you on the chest, Mike, and say, you, you're the problem. I don't want to hear about you. You're, you're, if your clients, you're, all your female clients show up and they're, they're all at 19% body fat and they are, you know, they, you know, they're all doing booty pictures and they're all feeling good and you know and they, yeah they they look good they feel good ain't no one gonna bitch about the programming if all your guys are at you know nine to fourteen percent body fat you know the guys who are 64 look like they're 44 and they feel good their their waistline is half their height and they're ripped and they got they look good and, and ain't no one bitching about program but that's the problem you is the problem you can't get bored and that's a tough lesson that's coaching 101 man so, Dan, this has been an absolutely awesome conversation. One of the other things you taught me is that the word essay means attempts. Attempts, yeah. And uh, that is, I had no idea. Had I known that when I was working my way through school and writing essays and realized that that was the background on it, I, maybe it would have been more engaged in each of the attempts that I've 
that I would have yeah. made back then. And as a teacher, I got to say, we don't do a good enough job. So this is why, I mean, th- th- one of the reasons, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I retired uh, from teaching at the uh, collegiate level. I still teach at St. Mary's, but I'm a lecturer. I'm a, a lecturer in strength and conditioning. But I, I got away from the academic job because I was so tired of my students cheating, constantly cheating. Cheating is, I would say, epidemic, but it's even bigger than that. I mean, it's, it's and what they don't understand is that my job isn't to, is not to give you an A, B, or whatever. My job is to get you to attempt to better yourself and struggle with this thing when, and whatever that thing is that, and it, it could be A squared plus B squared equals C squared to in this class. And it could be the invisible hand in the economics class. And it could be, you know, the Beowulf's three great fl- uh, fights in that class. But your job is to, to have the intellectual integrity to say, okay, I am now going to try to take a thought and swell it out to be part of the body of information. And I, am a, I say that out loud, and I am the last person I think sometimes in education to believe what I just said. I don't give a shit about your grade. It's like, do I, I mean, I have had one time, we had nine straight state champions in the discus that I coached, which is pretty hard to do because it's a yearly thing. I mean, if you have three in a row, it could be one kid, you know? And when I kept trying, and people say, why is, why is that bigger? Because so they had the national record holder, too. I go, why is that bigger? And it's like, because it proved that the system I was doing was working. I could take a young boy or girl and say, here's what we can do, and here's how the, how's we're going to do it. And we're going to, you know, and three years later, four years later, if you take this series, you could be a state champion, and I don't care how you look. I don't care what your DNA is. Maybe you won't be a state champion, but you, for one time in your life, you will know that you put it out there and you got what you earned. And that's kind of what education is supposed to be. It's not a, listen, there are classes where I didn't, I wasn't the best student, but I learned more than the best student. You know, I will put my academic credentials against anybody's, but what made me a great student, in fact, I was just pulling this out the other day because I'm retyping it. This is my first published article. It's on Beowulf. <laughs> and I guarantee all my classmates in that English class, not one, A, first off, not one of them published or got published. Yeah. And number two, they're all probably miserable high school English teachers, still red penning to death everything any student writes. You know, you know, if you want to make kids better writers, writers write, baby. Readers okay. read, throwers throw, jumpers jump, lifters lift, swimmers swim. Oh, just and it- I think that is an awesome way to wrap it up. Like no matter what it is that you're doing, you have to do the work you have to do. You can't just think about the work. You can't imagine the work. You've got to actually go in there and do the work, take the attempts, do the reps. Dan, I am very thankful uh, that you've taken the time to chat through a lot of this. We covered a number of different things. I hope people, as they listen to this, they take away a couple of items. One, There's some basic movements that you can go through and do every day, and you will feel better. You will get better. You will be better as you go along. Look good, feel good. (laughs) Look good, feel good. And Dan, where should we send people if they would like to follow what you're doing? See, and I even yep, I can give them a discount code too. So I listen uh, for free. DanJohn.net. Yep, three thousand pages of stuff you can read the rest of your life. Newsletters. Stories about my life, crappy stuff, good stuff, stupid stuff, but it's free. And then there's called, I don't like the name, but it doesn't matter because this is what the name is. It's called danjohnuniversity.com. And if you use this code, you get basically, I can't give it away for free, but because I, it's a business and I've got people to pay, but ESPEN, E-S-P-E-N, E-S-P-E-N will give you about uh, two thirds off. So one step from free. And in there, there's a thing called the workout generator where you don't even have to think, folks. You plug in how many days a week you want to work out, how hard, how long, and it just spits out. If you don't understand the exercise, you just press the button and it shows you how. And if that exercise is too easy, you scroll up and find a harder one. That one's too hard. You scroll that. It is absolutely, you are looking at the inside of my brain. And then there's tons of downloads, book length stuff for free. And then there's a great forum. Lots and lots and lots of articles. It's all part of your price. 
great forum, a great forum. I really like the people on the forum and I'm proud, you know, I'm proud to be associated with them. There's some really quality people on the forum. Oh, and then there are some extra courses. There's a bunch for free. And there's a couple other specialized one for like, if you can't go to St. Mary's and take my programming class, it's my programming class. If you can't, if you want to learn more about easy strength, I got two courses on easy strength. I think those are the only two there. Oh, and there's a goal setting course, which, but I think it's really a reasonable price. And we just, we decided to charge it because it, when you get to goal setting, it's going to sound kind of weird, but you got to got to have some skin in the game, I believe is the uh, Las Vegas thing. You know, if you've ever, you know, <laughs> I've been at parties <laughs> the week, the day or so after a football game, as when I coached at a game, and some of you in there, like, why didn't you guys do this? And you just want to scream at them. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> you stupid you don't have any skin in the game. All you were was sitting in the stands or somebody told you about the situation. But the reason we couldn't do that is our starting quarterback had just thrown up on the sidelines because of this thing that happened and, you know, concussion or whatever the story is. And our backup quarterback isn't Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady or Joe Montana. Our backup quarterback's name is Tommy and Tommy will be a very fine neighbor in the future. He'll mow his lawn and he'll, you know, he'll, but he's not going to ever be great. And so he couldn't just take the ball and throw it 60 yards. He could take the ball and throw it six on a good day. And that's what you got to have. And, and so the thing is, um, the reason the goal setting course is to talk about goal setting, you have to have some skin in the game to take it seriously. Awesome. We will include links in the show notes. And don't uh, forget E-S-P-E-N. Okay. E-S-P-E-N. We'll include links in the show notes. We'll note, note that in the uh, in the show notes as well. If you know of someone who would find this conversation useful, insightful, something that could make an impact on on their day, please share it and let us know via Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, Sales is a thinking process. How are you thinking differently about yours? Mm